Good morning, everyone. I'm Georgia Fevrier, Assistant Commissioner of Operations for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Bermuda. Today's first panel is Clear and Present Harms and will be moderated by Ms. Patricia Kasim. Some of the questions this panel will discuss include, what is privacy regulation supposed to achieve? How do we calibrate both the harms and benefits of data processing? And why does a reflection on the societal harms of technologies like AI matter? We will start with a video of Kashmir Hill. Hi, my name is Kashmir Hill. I am a technology reporter at the New York Times who covers privacy, and I am the author of the new book, Your Face Belongs to Us, a secretive startup's quest to end privacy as we know it. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about the reporting I did for the book and questions it raises about the deployment of AI. Um, so this book started for me a, a few years ago. I got a tip about the existence of a company called Clearview AI that had scraped billions of photos from the public web, including social media sites such as Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Venmo. Uh, it, its database is now 30 billion faces strong. It did not get consent from people to include them in the database. And it was secretly selling this, this superpower uh, to police agencies. And at the time I first heard about them, no one knew who Clearview AI was, what they were selling, who was behind the company. And so I set out to, to find out and answer those questions. And I really faced a lot of headwinds when I first reported on this company. They did not want to have the world know about them, even though they were you know, granting access to uh, all these photos of people, they themselves wanted to stay in the shadows. And so um, the company itself wouldn't talk to me. Um, they they ha actually had an address on their website at the time for a building I discovered did not exist. Um, I ended up going to police officers who had used the app, and I was lucky here because police officers don't always want to talk about the surveillance technologies they're using. But I remember the first officer who was willing to talk to me was a financial uh, crimes detective in Gainesville, Florida. And he said, I love this app. It works like no facial recognition technology I've used before. It works when somebody is looking away from the camera, when they're wearing a hat, when they're wearing sunglasses. He said he had a stack of um, photos of kind of known fraudsters on his desk that he had run through a, a traditional facial recognition technology that they've been using before in the state and had no hits. And then he used Clearview AI and he got hit after hit after hit. He described going um, out, he was patrolling the streets, um, and was able to take photos of college students standing outside of a bar in very dim light and find their social media profiles. Um, he said he would be the company's spokesperson if they would have him. He really loved it. And this for me was a breakthrough in the reporting. Um, but I had a very chilling experience with this because the officers I told to, I, the officers I talked to would say, well, let me demonstrate this for you. Let me show you how well it works. Send me your photo and I'll send you your results. And I did this with a number of officers and each time the officer would stop talking to me. And in the case of uh, two officers who ran my face, they said, well, this is very strange. You actually don't have any images come up in the app. And that was weird because I have many photos online. And what I would later discover was happening is that Clearview AI, you know, it didn't want to talk to me, um, but it did want to keep tabs on me. And so they had put an alert on my face. And whenever an officer was uploading a photo, they were aware of it and they were contacting the officers. They were reaching out to them. They told them not to talk to me. And in one case, they deactivated the officer's uh, Clearview app. And so this was really chilling for me because it showed me that this company, you know, collected my photos without consent and, uh, you know, was tracking me and that it had the power to not only see who law enforcement was looking for, but control whether or not they can be found. And so eventually um, I did get Clearview AI to talk to me with uh, kind of investigative techniques that I detail in the book. 
But I remember the first time I met with the founder, Wonton Tat, he said, well, let me, let me run a search of your face. And uh, I said, well, I don't think I'm going to have any results. I hear I'm, I'm blocked. And he says, oh, that must have just been a bug. And he runs you know, a search on me, and many images came up, I think over 100 images. And it was really quite shocking because um, it wasn't just you know, headshots and kind of images I had posted online. It was me at a concert in a crowd. It was me walking uh, in the background of someone else's photo. Um, I remember there was one photo of me with somebody I was interviewing for a story at the time, and I realized, wow, this could be a way of exposing sensitive sources if I'm photographed out with them in public. Um, so it was really quite, um, it was quite revealing, and it's part of why I wrote the book is, is kind of just how that will um, potentially change our sense of privacy and our ability to be anonymous if, if a tool like that is available more widely. In terms of how it's getting used now, um, I realize privacy regulators have kind of um, uh, effectively kicked Clearview AI out of uh, Europe and Canada and Australia, but they are still used uh, you know, here in the United States, police actively, um, actively using Clearview AI in investigations. It was used during the January 6th riots here where rioters stormed the Capitol. Um, when uh, we had a changeover in power and was used to help identify some of those people. Um, uh, Clearview has, has actually made the technology available to Ukrainians to use in their uh, war with Russia to identify spies, um, you know, help, help reunite people with their families. One of the more disturbing use cases is that Ukrainians were taking photos of dead Russian soldiers running their faces through Clearview AI to find their social media profiles so that they could send the photos of the dead soldiers to their loved ones so that they could see the kind of toll of the war, uh, hoping to, to sway public opinion there. Um, we, I've talked to many officers who have, who have said that Clearview AI is very helpful for their investigations, but at the same time, it can go wrong. Um, there was a case here, uh, a man who was arrested while driving to his mother's house. Uh, he lives in, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and he gets pulled over by four police cars. They ask him to step out of his vehicle. They arrest him for larceny in Louisiana. He says, I've never been to Louisiana before. It's a couple hundred miles away. He is taken to jail. He's held in jail for a week awaiting extradition for this crime of essentially stealing purses. Um, meanwhile, he says, that wasn't me. I've never been there. And his, he had to hire lawyers, and they find out that he was identified with facial recognition technology. And one of, this is one of the big questions that's raised by specifically Clearview AI. They have made this database of 30 billion faces, you know, including all of you. I don't think that even the privacy regulators who, um, who, have, um, who have kind of finalized their investigations in Clearview have managed to get their citizens taken out. So when there is a crime committed in New Orleans, Louisiana, and police are using this database, this database to search for you know, their suspects, they're searching all of us, all of our faces who are in there. And so in this case, this man in Atlanta, Georgia, Randall Coran Reed, he looked a lot like the person who stole the purse. And he was basically uh, had this warrant put out for his arrest based on very little supporting evidence. Um, and, and that is something that, you know, if we do decide this is a power that's, that police should use, I think we really need strict rules to make sure that they are doing more investigating because we now know of at least a handful of people here in the United States who have been arrested for the crime of looking like someone else. Um, you know, outside of government use, we are seeing facial recognition technology used by, by companies here and around the world to deter crime, specifically to deter shoplifting. And um, I think when you start having these AI you know, surveillance infrastructures put in place, it can be tempting to use them for other purposes. And the main example we have of that here in the United States is the events venue, Madison Square Garden. Very, you know, a huge arena. Uh, U2 plays there, you know, Mariah Carey plays there, big concerts. The basketball team, the Knicks plays there the hockey team, the Rangers, and it's on top of Penn Station, a big transportation hub. And so a few years back, uh, kind of with support from the Depart Department of Homeland Security, Madison Square Garden 
decided to install facial recognition cameras. And the idea was this is a way to keep out security threats. People who have been violent in the arena, people who may have a reason to threaten the crowd. But in the last year, the person who owns Madison Square Garden thought, well, I've got another good use case for facial recognition technology. I can keep out people I don't like, namely lawyers who work at law firms who have sued Madison Square Garden or its parent company. And so, you know, uh, the company behind Madison Square Garden, they just went to the websites of these 90 or so different law firms that had pending litigation against them, collected the photos of the lawyers from their own websites and put them on this ban list. And I've actually seen this happen. I went to Madison Square Garden, I bought tickets to a Rangers ice hockey game and took one of the women who worked at one of these firms and it was incredible. I mean, the minute we walked through the door, we walked through metal detectors, we put our purses on a security belt, and by the time we went to retrieve our bags, a guard approached us and they, uh, he asked her for her identification and uh, said, you know, my, my manager is gonna need to come over. And the manager came over and explained, hey, you're on the ban list. We identified you with facial recognition technology, gave her a note, told her she had to leave. And she said, she said you know, I don't, I don't work on a case against Madison Square Garden. I'm not involved in that. It's someone else in my firm. And they said, it doesn't matter. Everybody who works for your law firm is banned. And so, um, I mean, I, th I think this shows that facial recognition could usher in this new era of discrimination where people could be banned from businesses based on the work they do, whether they're a lawyer or an investigative journalist, uh, maybe their political beliefs, if they've you know, been vocal about that online or they're in some database that reveals them, or um, you know, just because they've, rid rid they've written a bad review of the business on Google or on Yelp. And um, at least here in the United States, we don't really have protections against that right now. Um, in New York, we don't have an access and deletion law. So you can't go to Madison Square Garden and say, hey, you know, what, what do you have on me? And will you please delete it? We don't have a law like that at the national level. We only have it in a few states. Basically, at this point, the kind of um, there's an uneven distribution of privacy laws and your face is better protected in some places uh, than it is in others. Um, we're also seeing individuals that are using facial recognition technology. I had one man who came to me and essentially confessed that he was using a, a public face search engine called PimEyes, and he was using it to uh, identify women that he saw in online pornography because he wanted to know their real names, he wanted to find their high school photos, and that he had used it on his Facebook friends because he was hoping to find risque photos of them. And he was successful. He found revenge porn, you know, images that were um, I, I findable by face but were perfectly obscure um, because they weren't attached by their name until a public face search engine came along. And he came to me because he said, I don't think I should be able to do this. I, I don't think a technology like this should be available to me. I hope the policymakers act. Um, in terms of what will happen in the future, um, as I detail in the book, Clearview AI is uh, has developed an app that works with augmented reality glasses so that you can kind of look around in real time, see a circle over someone's face, tap it, get these photos, get captions. Um, they uh, got funding from the Air Force here to, um, to develop this for possible use by soldiers on military bases. We've also had companies like Meta, you know, working on augmented reality glasses. The chief technology officer of Meta or Facebook, you know, has said that they would like to be able to put this ability into their glasses, but that right now they're holding back because they're worried about what society would think or whether it would be legal. But I could certainly imagine a world in which a company that had a social gra graph, you know, knows who's friends with who, could release an ability like this and say, that it was a opt-in or a consent model and say, okay, well, um, if you're comfortable with it, you can make your face recognizable and you can make it recognizable maybe just to friends or maybe to friends of friends or maybe you're comfortable having everybody you know, know your face because you're a TikTok influencer. You want them to come up to you. You want them to like and click and subscribe. Um, and so I could imagine a world uh, in which we have privacy settings for our face, like we currently have them for our profiles on social media sites. 
Um, so anyways, that is, um, that is what I am seeing in my reporting uh, right now and some of what I talk about in the book. I hope that you're having a great conference in Bermuda. I'm sorry I'm not there, um, but I hope this kicks off an interesting discussion about ethical data sourcing, uh, all of these databases that AI companies are creating, and whether or not we have the ability to get out of them. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hello, buenos dias, bon matin. As data protection regulators, we often rely on technology. Reporters like Kashmir Hill of the New York Times to uncover for us that which we don't know that we don't know. It's often on the basis of their news stories that we gain insights into what organizations are doing <clears throat> and gives us an in so that we can follow up with questions of our own. I've long admired the work of investigative journalists, particularly when they put their own privacy on the line with the aim of discovering what new information technologies are out there, how they work, what they're capable of, and how organizations are using them or misusing them. <clears throat> they have the courage to do things like run their own images through face search engines that frankly, I would not have the courage to do, nor could I reasonably ask my staff to do it. And even if I did, we all know the potential legal risks we as regulators might face, like allegations of entrapment or procedural unfairness that could compromise the utility of any evidence we might find. So in this panel, we're going to discuss the kinds of harms we're seeing result from artificial intelligence and facial recognition technologies that Kashmir and others have discovered are being used by law enforcement, governments, and organizations the world over. We're going to begin with Professor Teresa Skaza, Canada Research Chair in Information Law and Policy at the University of Ottawa, who's a world-renowned expert in privacy, intellectual property, and technology law and Dr. Jenny Tennyson, co-chair of the Data Governance Working Group with the Global Partnership on AI, and founder of Connected by Data, a UK campaign whose mission it is to give communities a powerful say in decisions about data so that it's used to create a just, equitable, and sustainable world. So, Teresa and Jenny, I'd like to ask you to discuss the kinds of privacy or other harms that result not only to individuals, but to members of groups and communities when AI technologies are used in a regulatory vacuum to exploit personal data, even de-identified data, in a manner that exacerbates imbalances of power in society. Thank you very much, um, uh, Commissioner, for, the, for that uh, introduction, and also uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to such an esteemed audience on um, such important issues. Um, the Clearview AI example is a really interesting one because it brought um, the long-standing practice of data scraping from the public web to the forefront. Um, and it did so in the context of AI technologies, which are powerful and data-driven technologies, uh, in the context of uh, social media companies, which as we know, uh, raise a whole host of uh, complex and challenging privacy issues. And it also involved facial recognition technology, which is one of the most problematic in terms of invasiveness, but also in terms of documented issues of bias and discrimination. So it really was almost a perfect storm um, of issues uh, around uh, privacy and the use of data. Um, I want to start, though, by noting um, that data scraping, the practice, has arisen as a privacy issue in other contexts as well prior to AI. Um, and it is a very widely used uh, practice, a very widely used a way of acquiring data. And so the first point I want to make is about, um, is really a kind of a baby in the bathwater point. Um, data, data scraping is used by a whole range of different actors, including civil society actors, researchers, journalists, governments, um, and private sector organizations as a way of obtaining data. 
And in some cases, data scraping may be the only way to obtain certain data. Um, a few years ago, I did some research on the, what I called the ecosystem of data scraping around the Airbnb platform, looking at who was scraping Airbnb data and for what purposes. And it really was an interesting combination of actors that included governments, for example, who were very concerned about the impact of the platform company on long-term uh, rental uh, accommodation in their municipalities, but who had no other way at that time of getting uh, good data on what the company was doing. Uh, there were also civil society uh, organizations that were engaged in very similar activities and researchers and so on. Um, and so, um, and of course on that platform, personal data is often mixed with other uh, types of data that can be used uh, for a range of purposes. So there's a tension here, as there is in so many contexts, between access to data in the public interest and the protection of privacy. And I think that any response to data scraping and the use of data scraping in, uh, in systems like generative AI, which are very powerful, has to also keep in mind that there are important um, other purposes for data scraping. Um, the commissioners, um, in a, 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 a 10 commissioners in a, a recently issued joint statement on data scraping placed the onus on social media companies to address um, data scraping from their platforms. And it's easy to understand why, because it, this is a really difficult you know, problem to tackle. Who are, who, you know, who are you going to place the onus on and how are you going to do it? Um, but limits on data scraping uh, from platforms have already um, uh, led to limits on research um, and to uh, limits on the transparency of the practices of those platforms as well. So again, just another uh, note of you know, the potential concerns um, with these types of practices. Um, the, the other thing to note is it's not just privacy anymore. The challenges and issues in the data-driven context frequently go beyond privacy, in part because data-driven technologies are embedded in so much of what we do, they rely on vast quantities of diverse data, they're extremely powerful. So we know that there were you know, clearly important um, privacy issues with uh, Clearview AI, um, there are privacy issues in, with social media, there are privacy issues in how police choose to use these technologies as well as how private sector organizations might as we saw with the uh, Madison Square Gardens example given by Kashmir Hill. Um, and some of these uses can raise other issues such as freedom of expression, freedom of association, uh, discrimination, and so on. There are also important transparency and accountability issues, um, for example, in how these uh, technologies were um, adopted by um, police, sometimes without even the knowledge of the chain of command uh, within a particular police service, certainly without the knowledge of elected decision makers, um, and there really is no opportunity for governance when technologies get adopted in this particular way, or at least it short circuits the governance procedures and practices that we've put in place for the adoption of uh, these kinds of technologies by public actors. And this is a huge issue, um, and it's not gonna get smaller. Generative AI is going to raise very similar issues for us as well, uh, presenting the same kinds of transparency and accountability challenges, particularly as it's integrated through workplaces um, as part of regular office software suites. Um, the rules we've been carefully formulating for discrete um, automated decision-making systems, for example, notice of use of AI, a right to know what personal data has been used in the decision-making process, and some sort of explanation of the steps in the decision-making process are not going to be adequate in the context of generative AI tools that are being um, adopted and used by um, uh, employees or staffers for different purposes without necessarily without it necessarily being clear within the, the system um, how and when that is taking place. Um, and so, of course, this raises the really challenging issue of you know, where to locate responsibility for, for privacy problems in these kinds of contexts with the platforms, with the systems, uh, with employers, with users, and how, uh, how do we uh, balance the different interests. Um, I'd also like to note that um, we, uh, have a problem that I link to the old saying that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, despite not having a, a universal global privacy convention yet, 
Um, in the last 30 years or so, many countries, um, as uh, illustrated by the number of people in this room, have enacted privacy laws and established privacy regulators. And these laws and institutions have reached a certain uh, maturity and independence. And as the data society has grown and expanded, this has led to a tendency to treat data-related issues as privacy issues and to frame them in this way, even though they are often um, more complex. And I know that most of you are aware that we're now in an era where silo approaches, siloed approaches to data issues are no longer adequate. Um, and some of you have been working to explore new avenues for cooperation and collaboration with competition commissioners, human rights commissioners, and others charged with different roles in relation to data and information. Um, this is an important trend, uh, particularly in the absence of broader uh, legislative reform. So I hope I've been able to flag some issues for you, uh, and I know Dr. Tennyson has m many more. We, we were trying not to overlap, and so I'll pass the baton to her. Thanks so much, Teresa, and thanks, Patricia, for inviting me here today, and it's wonderful to be here um, uh, with this audience. I have to say, I come from a background of open data and um, being uh, often traditionally seen the kind of privacy crowd as being in competition with the, or, or against the intention with, as you talked about, the, the kind of um, open data uh, community. So I'm very used to speaking about the benefits of sharing data, about um, the benefits of transparency and accountability, of, of driving research and development, of efficiency and effectiveness. And when I was starting in, in open data, we always thought that personal data could be put over there in a box somewhere so that we didn't have to worry about privacy harms. We didn't have to worry about identity theft or fraud or the way in which people might be exposed to danger. Um, we didn't have to worry about the kind of discrimination that comes about when um, personal data is misused or the chilling effects that we have when we're, we feel like we're being watched all of the time. But my role at the Open Data Institute and exposure to a number of different events and issues and communities has really um, brought me much closer to, I think, the community who's here today. And I just wanted to go through some of those kinds of challenges to the kind of binary between sharing data and, and shutting it down. And um, then talk about a couple of frameworks that I found useful for thinking about the impacts and harms of data, the kind of challenges that, they ar that arise from those, and then ask a few questions about what we should do next. Um, so the things that really challenged my very clear-cut view between open data and personal data um, I think one of the first things was uh, coming into contact with the indigenous data governance community and understanding there how data can be intimately connected with people even when it isn't personal data. So, for example, data about their land, their language, their knowledge as being um, incredibly important to and needing protection from use. Um, so that kind of indigenous data sovereignty, I think, is one challenge to our ways of thinking about privacy and, and openness. The second example was one when we were working on um, new kinds of data institutions like data trusts and ways of holding data so that they could be uh, um, responsibly shared with others. And one of the examples that we used was around biodiversity data, the location of endangered species. Again, this isn't personal data, but it is data that we want as a society to protect because we want to advance biodiversity. So that made me think beyond the kinds of personal impacts and societal impacts towards environmental impacts from the sharing of data. Then, of course, there are the kinds of events that we're all familiar with, the um, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandal, which really um, highlighted to me how the data and preferences and consent of other people could affect what was known about me. Um, and this linkage that we have and connections to other people um, in the way in which uh, that, that leads to knowledge of us, that our own consent is not enough to limit what is known about us. But also with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, the impacts on democracy and faith in democracy, those societal impacts that come from data use. And of course, that is also um, what we saw during the COVID pandemic, um, where, we can, where we saw contact tracing and the use of personal data as being essential for our response to a public health emergency. Then 
looking through my work at the Global Partnership on AI in this project that we did with the Turing Institute in the UK on data justice aspects highlighted to me how it isn't just, harms don't just come about because of direct harms from the use of data, but also because others benefit from data in the ways that we can't. So inequalities in access to data, inequalities to being able to use data, and inequalities in the framing of what systems and, and, uh, and AI gets produced over the top of that data mean that we are pushing ourselves further apart rather than together. And then finally, of course, over the last year, the, what, the um, real um, push around generative AI has highlighted the impacts of data and AI systems on creators and their livelihoods, as well on, as on supply chain workers who are used to label this data as well. So there's all sorts of these very complex areas where multiple interests are at stake um, and where those impacts aren't quite as simple as just like personal data having privacy impacts over here and everything else being okay. Um, and that we need to examine. So a couple of frameworks that I've been using in order to, to pick that apart. First is thinking really about our relationship to data and the different kinds of relationships that we can have with data. We're very used to talking about data that is about us, us as data subjects being represented in data sets, our faces, our names, our health information, for example. But there's also data that we create, whether purposefully or unknowingly, like just as we go about our lives, that might not even be um, associated with us, but nevertheless gets used in, in various ways. Um, here, I think if we unpick the challenges around Wikipedia, for example, which is one of the major um, sources of data for generative AI, we can see the complexity of that. The, the data that is created by people is all bound up with data that's created by other people as well. It's not as simple as being able to separate out individual interests. And then finally, there's the data that impacts us, not just data that's about us or that we create, but data that in use impacts us. An example here is the way in which police patrols um, in predictive policing might be directed towards particular neighborhoods based on past crimes and crimes committed by other people and lead to impacts of, around um, false arrest, around discrimination, uh, inequality of policing and over-policing of particular neighborhoods. So thinking about our different relationships with data um, and our different relationships with each other that arise from that data I think is important. The second framework is one that's been developed by Natalie Smuher at, um, at Leuven University where she talks about the difference between individual impacts collective or group impacts, and societal impacts. So for example, we have facial recognition systems leading to false arrests. That's an individual impact, something that those individuals can face. When that's a pattern of discrimination because, it, because people of color have different uh, uh, error rates when it comes to facial recognition, that becomes a structural discrimination against people of color. That's a group impact. And when we all suffer from an unequal society, that's a societal impact. Um, and she lists others as, as well as so societal impacts, for example, on our democracy and faith in democracy, on rule of law and our belief in the rule of law. And the challenges that she identifies and that, that get thrown up by those kinds of, of frameworks um, are, are, are number. So first of all, there's a knowledge gap when you uh, are discriminated against by, say, getting an insurance pricing that you think, oh, that's a, bit, that's a bit steep, but you don't know any better about how it might have been created, you don't know that that's a pattern of discrimination that is um, something that is experienced by other people within your group. So there's a, lack, and there's a lack of reporting that enables us to pick up on those wider community or societal kinds of effects. We also have a threshold problem. If somebody is, is, um, has a slightly higher price for insurance, using that as an example, but it's only slightly higher, it's not really damaging to them, not in a massive way, then that's not a, that, that feels under threshold for many of the effects that we care about. But when, again, that's a systemic issue that multiple people face, then that goes over a particular threshold. So we have to think about how we act on that collectively. 
we have, and uh, Natalie um, identifies this problem of egocentrism, the idea that consent and individual consent can manage all of these different kinds of risks, the idea that we can take into account all of the risks to groups and to society in the consent that we give for the use of particular data seems unlikely. Um, and then the many hands issue, where it's not just one organization that is controlling data that, that then leads to these impacts, but actually a whole network of interconnected organizations collecting, processing, and using data that lead to emergent effects like misinformation and challenges to democracy. And in all of this, we also have to balance interests, as Teresa said. Um, you know, the use of facial recognition is there because it helps police efficiency and, and, that, and enables them to do their job. And that is something that we as a society want to have happen, right? We need to be protected. We want to have people advertising to us about their beliefs um, through the democratic process, right? Um, so... Uh, ads aren't wrong, personalized and, and uh, targeted advertising in some places isn't wrong if it seeks to advance democratic participation. So how we make this, how we balance the interests of our society and different groups within our society becomes a real problem. So in conclusion, I think there are just three questions that I, I would pose. First of all, are our current legal frameworks fit for purpose? Are we taking into account the impacts of non-personal data, for example? How are we taking into account those collective and societal impacts that we just talked about? Second is, what transparency do we need? Um, so Kashmir talked about not even knowing that this particular Clearview AI algorithm was being used. We obviously need transparency around when AI gets used, what data gets used in that AI. But we also need to have greater transparency around the impacts of AI systems and data systems more generally, so that we know, we can monitor and know when to act um, when we see some of these collective and societal harms coming about. And then that final challenge, how we balance interests. Um, this requires a democratic mandate, it requires legitimacy, um, and that speaks to my own interest, which is in how we get the public to participate in those decisions so that communities who are affected get a powerful say. So to conclude, we need to revisit, I think, how we govern data beyond personal data and consider these collective and societal impacts. But we also need to retain social license and have a democratic mandate for uses of data that both protect us and benefit all of us. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jenny and Teresa. I'd like to turn next to data protection reg regulator, Z. Kin Young, the former Deputy Commissioner from Singapore, now CEO of the Singapore Academy of Law, Rebecca Slaughter, FTC Commissioner in the US, and John Edwards, ICO Commissioner in the UK, to discuss what our role should be in overseeing technologies like AI. Clearly, as you've heard, AI has broader impacts that far exceed our mandates and spill over into other regulatory domains like competition, communication, intellectual property, employment, human rights, health, even public safety and national defense. But as data protection commissioners, we play a critical role in regulating many of the upstream activities that if not properly governed from the start, eventually lead to many of the downstream harms that Teresa and Jenny spoke about. So it is incumbent on us as the first line of defense to address upfront issues like the lawful source and collection of training data, the transparency and explainability of algorithms that are developed and deployed, and the fair, appropriate, and reasonable uses to which data are being put, which requires us to interpret our enabling laws and increasingly draw upon broader ethical principles as well. In a sea of fast-moving legislative and policy proposals, how do we work with data protection laws we have in place now to do our part to contain the clear and present harms of AI? And how can we work in collaboration with regulators in other sectors to ensure that the full gamut of potential harms resulting from AI are being adequately and seamlessly addressed. Zikin, over yep. to you. Yep. Thank you. Well, in preparing uh, my remarks for this panel, I, I kind of I put myself in the shoes of, uh, 
how would I address a room full of uh, decision makers, right? And uh, guide them, provide a framework to guide them on how to deal with the clear and present dangers of AI. Now, the room full of decision makers will not be DPOs. It will be your board of directors. It will be your managers. And for them, uh, this is what I thought I'd propose. So first, I think when we think, think about harms, right? Uh, we often concentrate on harms to the individual, but take a step back, as we heard earlier today, sometimes we have to consider harms to groups of people, segments of society, segments of your customer. The second thing is that when we often talk about harms, we, it is always as a consequence of using AI. But I would ask him to consider there may be situations where not using AI may actually lead to harms to sections of the society and sections of your uh, uh, customers. And um, then very often the question in, in the boardroom is, oh, is, good, is there going to be AI regulation, right? How, how are we going to uh, deal with that? To them, I'll say, chill, right? Listen, yeah, that debate is passed. AI is being regulated, right? And uh, we, we do see three models for AI regulation emerging. The first is really uh, indirect regulation, regulation through the input for AI, which is data. I'll come back and talk about that a lot more later on. The second model, I think, is, uh, is best showcased by the, the EU AI Act where the regulation uh, prescribes requirements for the, implement, uh, for the use right, of AI. Right? It, re, uh, it regulates how you develop AI. It regulates how you deploy AI. So it's regula regulation of the process. Right? So for example, the EU AI Act requires that before deployment, you need to conduct conformity assessments. You need to put in place a quality management system. After deployments, you need to notify if there have been lapses right, of, um, of uh, conformity. And, uh, uh, if, uh, and if there has been breaches, you need to notify. Right? So um, that's an example. But of course, the, the Act also uh, severely restricts um, high-risk AI, imposes these requirements on... Uh, uh, severely restricts the uh, uh, AI that um, leads to unacceptable risk. For high-risk AI, these are the things that they, they put in place. And of course, for low-risk AI, uh, they kind of push uh, transparency requirements. There is actually a third group, uh, a third model that's emerging. And for those uh, uh, companies that are in that space, I might say, look out, right? There are sectoral regulations that, that apply. Uh, some of them, um, like the, the EU uh, Digital Services Act, right? Uh, they, they apply when you use recommendation systems and you are an online intermediary. If you are in that space in China, you are also subject to those regulations. Uh, China regulates the use of recommendation systems by internet service providers. Um, the Chinese system is interesting because uh, they, uh, not only uh, do they require uh, uh, assessments before you deploy, uh, they have pushed the requirements of um, algorithmic accountability through the requirements of uh, registration of information relating to how the model is supposed to behave. Right? And um, they also um, uh, regulate um, AI use in the, uh, for deep synthesis, your, your deep fakes, as well as um, generative AI. So that debate is over. So uh, as board of directors, what can we do? Right? So I was, I'll say that um, I'll focus this part of my discussion with them really on uh, where they are most likely to run across this, which is if they are using AI systems and if their AI systems happen to rely on personal data. Well, um, so uh, how do we go about doing it? I'll, I'll start first by explaining to them, right, that uh, data protection laws are basically based on the concept of accountability, right, and it, protect, it provides a very powerful yet flexible frame to guide them in addressing the harms that might be uh, that might arise uh, from the use or the omission to use on AI. And uh, if we were to understand data protection laws properly, know how to deploy um, uh, the various requirements and obligations, uh, we can actually take a very holistic approach and have a very, a very calibrated approach, right, to um, putting together safeguards. Uh, so it's not a question of whether I can use AI or I can't use AI, but it's really how do we um, put all these things together into a coherent framework. 
So um, I'll say that, you know, as board of directors, right, uh, you owe a fiduciary duty to your company, right, to consider when to use and when not to use. And if you do use, then how do you pre uh, make sure that the safeguards are adequate, right? And um, uh, one way of looking at it when you are engaged in that discussion is, well, let's be methodical about it. There are certain situations where the harms arise to specific individuals. There are certain situations where the harms may, be, uh, uh, may, may accrue to, not say accrue, but may, uh, may affect groups of individuals. So if you are um, using AI, how do you prevent harms to specific individuals? Well, um, uh, safeguards right, can be implemented at every stage. Right? During the development stage, consider using anonymized data. During the deployment stage, uh, well, of course, make sure you identify an appropriate legal basis for using AI uh, uh, because uh, for using AI and also, sorry, uh, uh, appropriate basis for the collection of additional personal data because that's required as input data for the model to work. So it could be uh, consent, it could be contractual necessity. And as you deploy the entire system, consider um, how would you provide sufficient information and transparency about how personal data that's collected by the system will be used by the model so that your, con your customers and your consumers have uh, the ability to exercise um, their, their decision and uh, if they choose to opt out, right, uh, especially when uh, automat automated data processing, um, automated uh, decision making is, uh, is involved, they can do so. So by calibrating these safeguards, which are part of your data protection regulations, you, you are uh, actually uh, in a position to um, respond right, and uh, reduce uh, the harm to individuals. Of course, there, um, there are situations where uh, you, have, you, you have to consider whether that to use AI may actually prevent harm. So um, you imagine you have a lawyer who is giving you advice, conducting uh, litigation for you, or uh, advise you, advising you in a mergers and acquisition um, deal. Uh, you would expect the lawyer to advise you if technology-assisted review is possible, and uh, some of these solutions use AI. And if that's something that will help reduce legal costs, that's something you would expect. So think, use that as a frame also to think about sometimes there will be situations where you need to uh, consider using AI because it helps to avoid a certain harm to individuals. When it comes to groups of individuals, um, I'll, I'll basically talk to them and, and say that the uh, responsible AI frameworks right, that implement some of these um, data protection uh, obligations are also there and, and can help you prevent harms to groups of individuals. I'll highlight two examples. Uh, we've always talked about the need to have good quality data because if your trading data set is no good, the performance is going to be affected. Good quality data has certain dimensions. One of the dimensions is actually accuracy. And accuracy is one of the obligations under data protection laws. There's a second thing, right? Bias testing. It's a, it's a well-known step and is present in many responsible AI um, frameworks. Uh, if you do it properly, you can reduce unintended discrimination to segments of um, your customers or, or, the, or the, uh, the, the public, right? Uh, and you've, if you did it properly, right, uh, that's something that you can prevent. So again, these are safeguards that you can put in place. And in certain situations, in order to, do, to conduct bias testing properly, you might actually need to use personal data. And then consider your business as well, right? Uh, in certain lines of business, you may actually need to use AI to avoid harm. One good example is um, an anomaly detection. Um, AI that does anom anomaly detection is uh, well known and it's a uh, fairly uh, mature and, and uh, very effective. And if, if, for example, you are running a payment platform or you're providing a platform that there are multiple users, by putting in place AI that detects anomalous um, behavior, you can prevent, for example, uh, fraudulent transactions. You can detect potential scams. 
And you do actually have an obligation to put those in place to avoid harms to segments of, your, of, of the customer base. If you are running a social media platform, uh, the, the, the big concern today is uh, online harms. So it, you might actually have to put AI in place in order to address some of these issues um, so that you are much more effective right, in your takedown measures in removing harmful contents. So I'll just conclude right, uh, by, with, with these remarks. Right? Um, having gone through that, provided a framework, right, I think that this uh, is a framework to, to, to help understand uh, how to deal with the harm uh, posed by AI. AI regulation seeks to address harms, and data protection laws are actually an uh, important dimension. So in, instead of having a binary discussion about whether you are uh, uh, not using AI uh, if there is a potential harm, let's see how we can uh, take a more nuanced approach. Let's see how we can put in place different safeguards throughout, throughout the different uh, throughout the a life cycle of development and deployment of AI, and uh, that might be a way to avoid harm. Uh, but I will end off by saying that uh, we all need to have work to, uh, to do because uh, while we are developing standards and promoting, uh, while, while we are talking about AI regulations, we should also uh, develop standards and promote uh, industry best practices. And uh, at the, a recent example of that is the Singapore and US effort in mapping the uh, NIST uh, risk management framework to the uh, Singapore's uh, AI Verify framework. Uh, with that, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Slaughter. Uh, great. Well, you know, a lot of the conversation <clears throat> around AI, as we've heard, talks about what should the laws say, what kinds of regulations should we have. I want to start by um, thinking about the laws that we have now and how they do very, very much apply in the context of AI. Um, when the DPAs from the G7 authorities gathered in Japan earlier this year, we put out a statement on AI, including the point that current law applies to the use of AI. Um, and I think that it just can't be emphasized enough because I think we are all tempted to sort of uh, fall for the magic of a brand new technology that is, I've heard, a wild west and unregulated and a whole new world. And um, it is new, but also some of the problems it is generating are not that new. So let me talk a little bit about the US perspective. Uh, as Deirdre said this morning, the US does not have a specific data privacy law. Um, I think that that is mostly a bug, but I will talk a little bit about the ways in which it is also a feature for us right now. Um, the Federal Trade Commission, unlike many of our colleagues here in this room, has a slightly different set of competencies. Uh, we do most of the US's data privacy enforcement work, but we do it under the auspices of the General FTC Act, which is more than 100 years old, and prohibits unfair and deceptive acts and practices and unfair methods of competition. And unfairness for deceptive, uh, unfairness for acts and practices is defined specifically as conduct that causes substantial injury that's not reasonably avoidable and not offset by countervailing benefits. Um, this means we think across almost the entire US economy about the ways in which business conduct, including with use of technology, can violate the law. Um, when it comes to AI, there are a few specific areas that we have been talking about and um, thinking that uh, current business practice may violate our existing laws. Uh, one of them is fraud. We have been a fraud enforcer for almost our entire history. It's a huge part of the FTC's enforcement program. Uh, AI is important to our fraud program in, or relevant to our fraud program in two ways. First of all, uh, AI can be used to turbocharge fraud with impersonation schemes, uh, deep fakes, and making sure that we are attending to that is really important. Uh, I'm also really concerned about fraudulent representations about what AI can do. Um, we hear that all the time. It's sort of a new version of snake oil sales. Um, I will tell you anecdotally, I, there, is, there are people who regularly send me sort of solicitations for business into my inbox because I think they think I'm the procurement officer at the FTC, which I am not. Um, but one of the things that I get 
This person has continued to email me, pitching me on his AI-powered system to detect whether my employees are criminals. Um, this is a very stupid thing for this person to email me, and I just hit forward and send it to our enforcement staff because I can, off the top of my head, think of three or four different ways that might that pitch might violate existing law. Um, so that's another part of the uh, fraud question. We've heard a little bit about um, unfair or discriminatory outcomes from the use of AI. That sounds very much in our unfairness authority. Um, and some of the remedies that we've heard a little bit about in terms of um, checking the outcomes of uh, AI deployment are things that I think are required under current US law. Um, and finally, we think a lot about competition at the FTC, obviously, and the ways in which um, the vast amounts of data that are needed to power AI and may be held exclusively by a few large companies can really exacerbate anti-competitive dynamics in the markets that we care about. Um, I think we've seen great examples in other countries of regulators working with each other, and the UK is a terrific example of this, to make sure they're thinking about competition and privacy and all the other uh, areas of the law that, that uh, AI could touch on, we can do a lot of that in-house at the FTC, not just on AI, but on all the other things that we work on. We also need to work with our colleagues across the US government, whether it's the Copyright Office, um, the labor agencies, uh, and we spend a lot of time doing exactly that and working to reach out to them. I want to just touch very quickly on a few things that are a focus for us when we're thinking about how to pursue these cases in new technology. We are very focused in the data area these days on moving away from a consent only model for all the reasons that we have heard up here today. It just doesn't work in today's data driven economy. I think there is still a really important role for transparency um, and making sure that companies are publicly accountable for what they are doing with data. But that is less on an individual user basis and much more on a sort of a public societal basis. So some of our recent orders on our data security cases have required companies to post a data retention schedule publicly. That's less about an individual consent from a user, but more about allowing academic, civil society, and the general public to see what companies are promising and help us hold them accountable for those promises. Um, we're very focused on minimization as a model uh, in our data security orders as well. Uh, the principles that if you don't collect it in the first place, you can't um, abuse it. It's not uh, at risk of being stolen are really important. Um, and finally, very relevant to the AI space, we are very focused on deletion remedies when we have data cases. Uh, we started this with our case against Cambridge Analytica. Jenny mentioned it earlier. Um, when we brought that case, we required the company to delete not only the data it had illegally collected, but also the models it built off that data. And I think that that's critically important because once the model is built, the company doesn't actually care about the data, but they really need that model, and that's what they're profiting from. And if we don't want companies to profit from their illegal activity, we need to make sure that they are not able to continue to do so. Um, so finally, I will just conclude by saying it may be that we need new laws. Um, I would like the US to have a data privacy law, but we will not avoid doing the work that our current law both requires and allows us to do while we wait to see if new laws are passed. And at the heart of that work always has to be people. Um, I think we get very lost in these very technical conversations sometimes, but remembering the human side of these cases, both the people that we serve and are working to protect, and also the fact that there is human accountability for uses of AI, the development, the deployment, um, the consideration of it. There are people making those decisions, and those people can and will be accountable for those decisions. So um, that's where we are focused, and I'm really looking forward to engaging with colleagues from all over the world as we continue to discuss these important issues. Thank you so much. That was great. John, over to you. Thanks, Patricia, and thanks to Alex and the Bermuda Authority um, and the GPA for organizing this session. Um, I want to just give a nod to the uh, keywords 
that the uh, conference is themed around um, ripples, waves, currents. Firstly, these sessions are a great way to keep us current. Um, second, um, AI is a building wave, uh, and we risk being swamped or overwhelmed by it, or we can get on board and surf it into shore. And I think uh, I align with Rebecca that we're going to take the latter course. Um, I reject the language of regulatory lacunae. I reject the language of a regulatory vacuum. Uh, these technologies are entering into a marketplace that is already um, regulated in the UK through the UK GDPR. That is a principles-based data protection law, which is itself based on the OECD principles, which inform um, most data protection laws around the world, including those that we heard about last night from the Caribbean region. So concepts of fairness, transparency, accuracy, explainability, security, these are all already part of the legal framework. They can be deployed against all manner of um, AI offerings in the marketplace at the moment. At the ICO, we apply our full uh, regulatory philosophy to um, these emergent technologies, and that means uh, working upstream uh, and making compliance easy, reducing the cost on businesses, and we do that through issuing guidance. We've issued, for example, award-winning uh, guidance on AI and data protection risk toolkit. We have an innovation advice service, which will turn around um, answers on novel questions about the application of the law to a new technology within 10 days. We have a regulatory sandbox. Uh, we have issued this year advice on the application of those principles to generative AI. Um, we've explained in those that um, the other under, underlying principles of data protection law will apply, accountability. You've got to be able to explain and demonstrate your compliance with the law. Data protection by design and default, risk assessment ex ante. So what I think we've done at the ICO is to provide certainty about our approach, provide clarity for innovators and business. Uh, and I think those steps should go a long way to improve regulatory com compliance. That means, I think, with that, with that clarity that we've provided, there is no excuse uh, for not considering the harms and risks of these deployments. And that means we need to move to enforcement, and we've shown that we've been willing to do that as well. Uh, after our initial um, overtures with Clearview AI, which uh, Cash Hill uh, spoke about so, um, uh, with such insight this morning, um, we, you know, Clearview withdrew from the UK market. We pursued uh, enforcement action requiring that they delete their, uh, any data about UK citizens. So that is a, a regulatory action which is subject to appeal but it demonstrates that we've been willing to um, apply the existing regulatory models to these new uh, technologies and to say that there is unfairness, that when you have a database of 30 billion images, uh, that that constitutes uh, monitoring of citizens, which is one of the findings underpinning our um, decision. We've recently issued a preliminary enforcement notice, which means it looks to us as if this company may be in breach of its obligations under UK law. That company is Snap uh, in relation to its deployment of an AI chatbot. Now, the preliminary is important uh, because due process means that company has the ability to uh, provide representations and explain to us why they believe that we've got it wrong. But our preliminary uh, ruling is that they have failed to take adequate cognizance of the risks uh, of, that, uh, of that application. By the by, and apropos of nothing, a colleague's 14-year-old daughter who is a um, Snap user uh, asked this of the AI bot. Have you heard of the Information Commissioner? It replied, yeah, I've heard of the Information Commissioner. They're responsible for upholding rights in the UK, including data protection. Uh, she went on to say, um, do you follow the Information Commissioner's rules? And the Snap AI chat bot replied, no. <laughs> I, I don't follow the Information Commissioner's rules. I'm just here to chat and provide information. Um, so I think um, you know, those cases are really quite instructive. They send really important messages uh, out into the economy that um, 
There is no vacuum. There is no lacuna. There is somebody who is uh, monitoring this. There are guidelines for those who want to get it right on our website, uh, and there are risk assessment tools that we expect uh, to be used. Um, but I also um, take the challenge that Patricia said, that uh, these technologies engage multiple uh, regulatory domains. This is not new. Uh, social media engaged competition, intellectual property, content moderation, in the same way that AI does. But I think from those earlier failures of regula regulating social media, for example, of being overwhelmed by that tsunami, uh, we have learned, we have in the UK convened the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, which brings together uh, digital regulators, including the ICO, Ofcom, which is the communications regulator regulating content and has new responsibilities coming up under the online safety bill. I think it's still a bill. It hasn't been signed by the king yet. The Financial Conduct Authority and the Competition and Markets Authority. And it's really important to be able to give um, coordinated takes on how we will approach this, because there are some tensions and overlaps uh, in, in regulation here. Um, but we have been commissioned by uh, government to provide, through the DRCF, a multi-agency advice service. So again, providing uh, clear uh, advice about how uh, we will apply our laws in ways which are consistent. Um, the other sort of um, coordination I think that is really important is through fora like this. Uh, and we have at the GPA this week um, an ICO-led uh, AI in employment resolution, which will set some standards and expectations and will tell, again, industry and the economies, not just of the UK but around the world through our co-sponsors and through the adoption, I hope, uh, of this forum, uh, where some of those guardrails and boundaries are, what the expectations of the regulators are, and that, I think, helps to moderate uh, some of the rush to market that we've seen introduce such harms. Um, so I think it's interconnected resolutions like that which create the ripples, which are then noticed and picked up throughout the AI system. And I'll end with a little wave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. I'd like to just uh, open up the floor now to all of our panelists and ask you if you uh, were um, intrigued by something that your colleagues said and you have a response or something you'd like to add or comment on. <laughs> Me, I, go, go ahead, ahead Jenny. Um, it, it's a question, really. So one of the things that I, I talked about was how it... Um, in many uses of data, then there are complex balancing and uh, complex interests that need to be balanced between, you know, different groups of people, between the organisations who are wanting to make money off it and, and profit, and the um, uh, and others who are affected by it. And I just wondered how you uh, how you're seeing how you do that balancing of interests as as regulators and the role that you see for for the public to get involved or those who are actual stakeholders in it to, to be part of that decision making? I, I think it's a really important question. Um, when my oldest daughter was in kindergarten, her teacher used to say to the kids who would complain a lot, kindergartners can do hard things. And I think all the time, that's true. Kindergartners can do hard things, and so can regulators, so can attorneys, um, so can technologists. We have to acknowledge that sometimes they are hard and that there are real trade-offs, and I think we have to be clear-eyed about what those things are and as transparent as possible. Um, one of the things I've really advocated for at the FTC is reinvigorating our rulemaking process, which we have done. Um, and one of the reasons I like rules um, is that they provide both clarity in terms of guidance to markets that are enforceable, uh, and John talked very eloquently about why that's important, but also because they're participatory. Um, they allow the public, academics, civil society, industry to weigh in and tell us what they're seeing in the markets, how they think the law should be applied, where there are problems. Um, we currently have an open rulemaking proceeding on commercial surveillance and data security that we opened about a year ago, um, asking, I think, 95 different questions about data, 
AI, um, all the ways it's working in the economy. And we got a huge public comment record out of that, talking about some of the perils, some of the promise, some of the opportunities, some of the things we should think carefully. That record is open to all of you to look at as well. It is publicly available, and I think just convening that record is huge, huge uh, public value that will have staying power, um, because I don't think there is another place where all of those different perspectives are openly gathered on one website. So uh, it's, it's, I think, listening carefully to what people are saying is a really important thing for us to do. I'm going to turn to John, but then I'm going to ask Zee Kin to talk about his experience in when he was in the Singapore office. Go ahead, John. Thank you. I think it's a really important question because we can, we can sometimes have a slightly negative focus as regulators at fora like this, but it's really important to recognize the, um, uh, the transformative and beneficial effects of this te technology. Um, it's to return to the theme, you know, we can't be kin canute. We're not going to hold back the tide. I use AI every single day. I use generative AIs very frequently. The, these technologies deliver us content. They improve our lives. They are going to transform the way the ICO does its business eventually. So, uh, you know, it's, you know we, 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 we must recognize that there is a market for these because there is a demand for them because they create great efficiencies. We want to, society to be the beneficiary of these efficiencies and these transformations. Um, but we also need to ensure that they are deployed in ways which um, are cognizant of the risks and have, have properly weighed and accounted for those. Uh, I, I know that uh, you did some early work in Singapore on, in this area, so maybe you can elaborate. And then, Teresa, I know you have things to say about what we should do as data protection <laughs> regulators. Yeah, may, maybe I'll, I'll just share um, uh, an approach that I took when I was in office. So basically, very often as data protection authority regulators, uh, we always become in too late. A breach has happened, we come in too late, and then we, it's very, we, we often find out what's wrong, right? But we should also put in additional efforts, right, to actually explain those cases where we found there were no breaches and explain why we thought it was okay. So coming back to this, um, to, to this uh, the question, right, if you have to talk about risk assessments and a balancing tests, right, there are several things we can do. If you find a good example of someone who's done it right, pick the right case and actually explain what in fact was done and why we thought that it was right. We've, we took pains to actually release decisions, not in this, on this specific topic, but that's what we did. And uh, the other thing is, of course, by recognising uh, it does reinforce. So, so there was one actually uh, one, one specific example relating to AI that um, um, there was sufficient transparency. They had a policy around how uh, personal data was used in credit scoring, right? And it was disclosed. It was given to the individual. So we picked that up and said that you know what you did this. It is good, right? It 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 uh, it acquitted you. It was good. So that went out to the industry. That people knew that if I did that. It's good, right? So, so positive um, reinforcement, reinforcement of what's positive, uh, that's actually an important thing I think regulators can do. Also, in, uh, in encouraging in data protection impact assessments to take a much broader view of the uh, persons, individuals, groups, and communities potentially impacted. And I think we, it behooves us to push uh, regulated entities to take that much broader lens beyond just their consumers. Um, and uh, directly impacted individuals. So I think that's a, a very important tool, and thank you for raising it. Teresa, what, what can we do more uh, as data protection regulators? Well, I, I actually, I, I wanted to, to maybe build a little bit on, on the balancing question, which I think is a really good question and a very challenging one. And, um, and our data protection laws, for the most part, focus on personal data and with the concept that anonymized data fall out of scope. And I know this is something that you've thought about, and I'm sure as the regulators have as well. And so once data are, are properly anonymized, they're out of scope. But as, um, as Jenny has 
discussed, and, and as many privacy scholars have been talking about, uh, anonymized data raise significant issues as well. Um, and so you have in, in data protection laws a dichotomy that doesn't necessarily reflect the ways in which data are being used, data that have been extracted from humans are being used um, in AI, um, which potentially creates governance gaps. And, um, and so, you know, maybe the FTC approach, which focuses on harms rather than on like the, the concept, narrow concept of personal data, offers some advantages in this respect. But I'm just wondering um, what the commissioners think about this, um, this challenge with the ways in which anonymized data can be used that, that have harms that are very similar to um, the harms of personal data. Oh, I mean, just, just to start. The, the, it's debatable. I mean, there's a big debate in our community about the extent to which anonymization can take a data set out of the definition of personally identifiable. Um, and I, I don't think it's the time to rehearse that. But again, I think somebody talked about the needle this morning between um, privacy protecting and um, properly anonymize uh, and, and, and the utility. Um, and the, the more protective it is, the less utility you get. So I think we need to be prepared to um, sort of patrol that boundary. But I think um, I mean, Z King's had a lot, a lot of thinking about this as well. Yeah, so for, um, I, I, I do agree that um, um, we, we've kind of like come to the point where even if it's anonymized, uh, we don't say that it is totally out of um, remit, right? Uh, there are certain guidelines to keep it anonymized and certain guidelines and, and context. So I think uh, that, that's that. But I, I thought uh, the point um, that we should remember is while you may, we have used anonymized data in development and deployments, when it is deployed and when it is used, personal data continues to be required as additional input data. And that's where we come back in again, right? Because uh, if you didn't do all your uh, debiasing properly, if you didn't uh, do your work properly before in the development stage, it can lead on to downstream harms. And I think that's where um, uh, we need to, uh, I, I think that's where data protection laws can engage again. Thank you very much. Um, you know, this, this panel was about clear and present harms and what we as regulators should be doing here and now to um, prevent the kinds of harms that Kashmir uh, talked about. But I do hope as a community that we will continue the conversation on some of the more existential future harms as well, which is, behooves us all as citizens of the world to, uh, to uh, really think about deeply. And that will be the subject of another day. I want to thank uh, Alex White, Commissioner White, and his whole team from the Bermuda Privacy Commission uh, for their so generously and graciously hosting us. I want to thank the uh, Secretariat of the GPA for all their background work in bringing us together on this annual basis. Uh, most importantly, I want to thank Marty Abrams uh, for, and the IAF for all their support in bringing this panel together. And to Chris Parsons uh, from my office back at home uh, for all of his assistance in bringing this illustrious panel together. So please join me in thanking them once again.